is. Just to, um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Sarah McKim. I'm a PI at the University of Dundee. Um, I work on barley developmental biology. Robbie Wa, um, who normally would be chairing, is away, so I will be chairing for today's talks. I'm really delighted to welcome Blake Myers, who is a member and principal investigator at the Donald Danforth Plant Center in St. Louis, and he is a professor in the Division of Plant Science and Technology as well as the, at the University of Missouri. He is the recipient of several prestigious awards, which you can read about in his bio, and most um, recently was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2022. Some of you may have interacted with him as an editor at the Plant Cell, where he has been actually editor-in-chief since um, January 2020. I first heard um, Blake speak at a PAG meeting in um, San Diego in 2016, and I was super impressed with the scope of his work. Um, and today we're going to hear about some of his amazing science about phasey RNAs. And after his talk, we're going to he hear from a member of his team, Sebastian Belanger, who I will also introduce right now. He uh, obtained his PhD um, in plant sciences in the lab of Francois Bézil. Um, after graduate studies, um, Dr. Belanger focused on the development of barley microspores and then moved to the lab, um, to Blake's lab, um, where he's been studying the role of 24 nucleotide long phase RNAs in male reproductive development. So his current research aims to understand more about the environmental control of pollen production. So um, I hope you will all welcome um, Blake and Sebastian for their talks today. Um, for both talks, um, as you have questions, I'm sure you will, please put your questions in the chat. We're gonna have a general kind of Q&A and discussion period at the end of both talks. Okay, so I will um, pass it over to Blake to start our seminar today. And are my slides showing up okay? They are, they look great. Great. Thank you very much. So it's really a pleasure to to speak. I wish uh, wish we were in Dundee. I, I think I last visited Dundee probably over a decade ago. Um, this uh, first slide just shows you the front of the Danforth Center, um, where I've been since 2016. And so I'm going to tell you uh, sort of a general overview of phase RNAs uh, with a particular emphasis on the work that we've done in maize. Uh, because that's where we really got started in their reproductive role. And then Sebastian will take over from there and tell you about the work that we've been doing um, in, in other species. Uh, so let me start out with just an introduction about the dicers, because the dicers are the enzymes which make small RNAs in plants and plants and animals. Um, and so this is a phylogeny here that represents the five dicers that we know about in plants um, with the animal out group down here. And these dicers have very specific roles that define different pathways for small RNA production and activity. Um, dicer 1 is uh, well known for its function in producing microRNAs, um, and microRNAs function in post-transcriptional control of mRNAs. Um, dicer 2 is involved in um, antiviral defenses, uh, and we're not gonna, you're not going to hear much about dicer 2 today. Uh, and then dicer, oops, sorry. Uh, dicer three is involved in the production of heterochromatic sRNAs, which function in genome defense by silencing uh, transposable elements, um, and they, these function in the nucleus. And dicer four is involved in the production of phase RNAs or TASI RNAs, uh, specifically the 21 nucleotide class. And there's some redundancy with dicer two for antiviral defenses. And then what you'll hear a lot today about dicer 5, which is uh, the most interesting dicer for our work, uh, because it's involved in the production of 24 nucleotide phase RNAs that have an important role in male fertility, particularly in the grasses. But we've shown that, um, that the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs also exist in new dicots, but, the, but dicer 5 does not. And so just to highlight that in this phylogeny here, if this were a, an Arabidopsis, uh, phylogeny. Uh, here's the Arabidopsis dicer 3. There's no dicer 5 um, in Arabidopsis. So the, the split between dicer five, 3 and dicer 5 occurred only in the monocots. Um, so there, there are four dicers in eudicots and five dicers in, in monocots. And so that's emphasized here in this next slide um, where you can see uh, this, is, this is the only member of that branch 
uh, that we see in eudicots, um, and then there was this duplication that occurred uh, in the monocot lineage, perhaps 150 million years ago um, or so. And um, I, I won't have time to tell you about work that we've been doing on the evolution of the whole pathway, looking a little bit more broadly, um, but we have good evidence that uh, these 24 nucleotide phase RNAs emerged with flowering plants, that is, they predate the split of the eudicot uh, eudicots and the monocots, um, suggesting that the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs uh, that are produced by DICER-5, since they predate the emergence of DICER-5, they probably depended on DICER-3 in an earlier state. Okay, so let me tell you more about these, um, these phase RNAs, and particularly uh, tell you about the two classes of phase RNAs that uh, are quite abundant in anthers. Um, and so plants have this, this specific pathway for the production of phase RNAs, uh, and this was described in coming up on 20 years ago now. In 2004, there were several groups that identified the so-called uh, transacting sRNAs or TASI RNAs. There are 21 nucleotides in length, um, and so it's, it's a little bit uh, intricate, this pathway, uh, but essentially what it involves is some sort of precursor for these TASI RNAs that's targeted by a microRNA. And it's typically a 22 nucleotide microRNA. Uh, microRNAs can be either 21 or 22 nucleotides in length. That 22 nucleotide length endows that microRNA with this special property of recruiting a, an enzyme known as RDR6 to the cleavage product. Okay, so here's our precursor. Uh, here's a microRNA that's loaded into an Argonaut 1 protein that directs slicing between the 10th and 11th positions of the microRNA. Uh, there's this recruitment of RDR6, uh, probably by Argonaut 1 that has been activated by this 22 nucleotide length of the microRNA. Uh, RDR6 is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which does exactly like what the name suggests, that is it polymerizes a second strand of RNA using the first strand as a template. So you end up with double-stranded RNA. Once you have double-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA is a substrate for dicers, and I just told you about the five dicers that exist in, in monocots. Um, and in this case, dicer 4 initiates from that cleavage site, and it measures and cuts, measures and cuts, measures and cuts, measures and cuts. And so a, a key aspect of this is because the, the cleavage directed by the microRNA is incredibly precise, if you have a thousand copies of this precursor, then you'll have a thousand copies of this double-stranded RNA that get processed in exactly the same way. So you get a thousand copies of this duplex, a thousand copies of this, a thousand of this, a thousand of this. And so when you sequence them, you can see this very precise head-to-tail orientation in the genome. And that's where this name of phasing comes from, because they have this, uh, this unusual head-to-tail arrangement. Um, and so then these 21 nucleotide small RNAs, they're secondary because the microRNA is the primary, and they, they also get loaded into an Argonaut, and then they can go off and function to target other transcripts encoded at other loci in the genome, hence the trans name. So I apologize for all the jargon, but um, it's sort of necessary to explain how this process works. So you have microRNAs that trigger production of sRNAs that go off and target other transcripts in trans, and in this case, 21 nucleotides in length. And this was all worked out in Arabidopsis um, that has a DICER-4 um, and makes these TASI RNAs that are primarily involved in development, um, but not in reproductive, not so much in reproductive development. But then in around 2010, I think it was, there was a paper uh, from Sundar's lab at UC Davis that examined the, in rice, uh, examined small RNAs in um, in the inflorescence and identified a second class of phase RNAs that had a different length, 24 nucleotides. And in the years since then, uh, we and other labs have described that there's this additional dicer, this monocot specific dicer known as dicer 5, and dicer 5 is the dicer that cuts to the 24 nucleotide length. Um, and so there are essentially two different size classes of, of these phase RNAs. In this pathway on the right, there's a microRNA, MIR-2275, which is specific to this pathway. So we've got two components that are specific, MIR-2275 and DICER-5. And the, these 24 nucleotide phase RNAs are highly enriched in the flowers, um, and as you'll see, particularly in the anthers, and they're required for full male fertility. 
Okay, so uh, let's focus on this class. I, I, we don't have time to tell you about 21 nucleotide phase RNAs, but there's lots of interesting biology there also in, in anther development and reproduction, um, but we're going to focus on the 24 nucleotide class for today. Okay, so um, a, a lot of my lab's prior work has focused on maize. Uh, maize is a great system to work in. It has separate male and female on fluorescences, so you can get large numbers of anthers uh, relatively precisely staged. Uh, these are the two flowers in the maize spikelet. Um, you'll see some cross sections of anthers today. So the anther, anther is essentially uh, sort of four tubes that are fused together. And so if you make a transverse section, a cross section, uh, you get four tubes. The four tubes look like this. Uh, they have uh, five layers in a maturing anther, um, the epidermis, the endothesium, the middle layer, the tapetum, and then the archosporeal cells that become the myocytes. And so the tapetal layer is that layer that interfaces between um, the sporophyte and the gametophyte, essentially. So the tapetum is a key layer. And a lot of this work has been done in collaboration with Ginny Walbert's lab um, at Stanford, who brought uh, the reproductive biology uh, and development to our projects. So one of our early collaborations with Ginny's lab was to characterize the small RNAs over the course of anther development in maize. So this is just one lobe. If I go back, uh, what I'm showing you across the top is just one lobe of this cross section in a developmental progression from these early stages when the cell layers are being defined through meiosis, through pollen development, um, gametogenesis, all the way to mature pollen. And so those sizes are shown down the middle here. And what you're looking at is a heat map of the loci that produce either 21 nucleotide phase RNAs or 24 nucleotide phase RNAs. And these loci are, that we've represented here are almost uh, entirely exclusive to reproductive tissues. That is, if we sequence these in leaves or roots, uh, they would be essentially absent. Um, and you can see that there are 463 loci that make 21 nucleotide phase RNAs, 176 that make 24 nucleotide phase RNAs, and these are different loci from one another. And each one of these loci is targeted by a 21 nucleotide, sorry, a 22 nucleotide microRNA to trigger the phase RNAs. And really, the key take-home message from this slide is that there's an early peak of 21 MERS, and then there's a later peak of 24 MERS. Um, and so, two genetically separable pathways to produce lots of phase RNAs in anthers. And we knew from an, uh, an early stage, going back uh, almost a decade ago now, that there was a role for these phase RNAs in, um, in male reproductive uh, fer fertility and success. Um, and so we're going to focus on the 24mers uh, today. Okay, so um, let me tell you about the different cell layers that are required for this process. Uh, this is from that same 2015 paper. And essentially what we did was a combination of genetic analysis where we took advantage of the really well-defined um, uh, male sterile mutants in maize uh, that are blocked at different stages, early stages, all the way to later stages. For example, MS23 has a defective tapetal layer. Um, amyotic 1 is defective in the myocytes. MISCA1 is, has an epidermis, but the other layers are defective. So we sequenced uh, in those mutants, and then we performed in situ hybridization. So here you can see one lobe, and you can see signal in the outer layer. Um, and don't have time to go through all of the data, um, but we can sort of summarize it uh, something like this, where the 21 nucleotide phase RNAs are triggered by a specific microRNA early on in development, uh, require dicer 4 for production, probably Argonaut 5 for their action, um, and they're produced from lots of loci. And then these peaks sort of represent the abundance, so they fade out by the time you get to binucleate microspore stages. Um, the later 24 nucleotide phase RNAs depend on the, uh, this early peak of abundance of MIR-2275, uh, and the DICER-5 enzyme is required for their production, um, and they're produced from about 150 loci, and we still don't know the argonaut that they're loaded into. Um, but what you can see down here at the bottom is that the tapetum turns out to be a key layer, and I'll show you some evidence for that in a few slides, but it, um, it seems to make the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs and accumulate them, uh, although many also go into the germinal cells. Okay. Uh, so, to study the DICER-5 enzyme, we collaborated with our colleague Bing Yang, who's at the University of Missouri, 
Uh, we CRISPRed out the DICER5 enzyme. This is in maize. Um, and we got a, a variety of alleles. Um, and then we characterized the small RNAs uh, in those mutant alleles. And what you could see is that the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs, and this is in the heterozygote, so it, it has one copy of the active DICER5. They're relatively abundant, quite abundant. Um, but in the, the homozygous loss of function mutants, there was a near complete absence of the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs. And in fact, these res residual layers are probably misannotations of other 20 formers, uh, the heterochromatic sRNAs, that are not the reproductive phase RNAs. So we believe that these are complete loss of function and there's no redundancy with other dicers. Um, and so the loss of dicer 5 uh, gets rid of all of these, uh, these uh, phase RNAs. Um, and so then we characterize this mutant at a phenotypic level. Um, we looked at anther development uh, in, in terms of the architecture of the anther, going all the way through the stages where the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs would peak. So they sort of peak uh, about the middle of this uh, developmental progression. Um, and it looked like the anther architecture was normal. So we didn't see an obvious defect in development um, at these stages when the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs are peaking. Um, and when we looked at meiosis, meiosis also progressed um, more or less as normal uh, all the way through the tetrad stage. But when we looked at the plants um, at the sort of gross phenotypic level, uh, we could see that the, the anthers did not extrude. That is, the plants are male sterile because the anthers never get large enough to emerge from the uh, from the flowers. And you can see that when we line up a set of anthers down here from the dicer 5 mutant compared to the heterozygous sibling, uh, the anthers are smaller, thinner, um, and really less, uh, less happy. So there's clearly a defect, but it looks like uh, that defect is after meiosis and that the anthers are really just failing to thrive. So they are produced, but, um, but the, the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs seem to be required for full male uh, fertility and, and that is the um, the, the uh, robust growth of the anthers. So we looked into this in, in uh, greater detail. Um, so here you can see um, the three millimeter anthers. So this is a, probably a few days after the peak of the abundance of the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs. In wild type, um, you can see the tapetum is relatively densely stained, starting to compress down. That You can see the myocytes, the, the uh, compression of the myocytes here is just a, an artifact of the, the fixation process. But in the dicer 5 mutant, you can see that the tapetum is still relatively spongy and diffuse and, and interacting with the, um, the myocytes. Uh, and in that, this other allele, it's, it's also uh, relatively spongy. And in fact, this uh, the middle layer that is the third layer in, which is essentially compressed and gone and wild type, is still present. So these anthers are really failing to advance successfully through development. And we can measure that in more detail. Uh, we can also look at things like the, uh, the stage of the um, cell uh, cell development, um, and so the tapetal cells are unusual in that they go through an, a normal process of formation of binucleate cells. So you can see the two nuclei in these cells of, of wild type. Um, and in dicer, uh, they fail to advance into that binucleate stage. And so here we've just done a false color on the bottom where the red are the binucleate cells, and in the dicer 5 mutant, there are many fewer of these. If we look at where the um, the the phase RNAs and dicers are localizing by uh, single molecule fish. Um, on the right here, you can see dicer 5. This is in a, a wild type anther. You can see these yellow dots here that form this ring, uh, which is the tapetal layer that surround the myocyte. So dicer 5 expression that, um, is highly specific. Uh, the 24 nucleotide phase RNAs, here we've used a set of, uh, of phase RNAs from one particular locus. Um, you can see very robust accumulation, again, in the tapetal layer, but also in the myocytes themselves. So they're being produced in the tapetum by dicer 5 and then migrating into the myocytes. Um, so we have that, that ring-like expression around the tapetum. So the tapetum is clearly a very important um, layer for this. In the dicer 5 mutant, of course, there's no dicer 5 mRNA, and there are no 24 nucleotide phase RNAs that are detected. 
If we zoom in a little bit closer, um, you can see that there's really robust cytoplasmic localization of these phase RNAs, which might suggest to us something about uh, the potential roles of the phase RNAs, uh, maybe a little bit of signal in the nucleolus. Um, and you can see the same sort of thing in the myocytes. So again, ro robust cytoplasmic accumulation. Um, and so that, uh, as I say, that may tell us something about where they're functioning and what they might be doing. However, uh, a colleague of ours, Yi Jin Chi, had published this paper about a different class of small RNAs, that is the heterochromatic sRNAs, which are known to function in the nucleus. Uh, and it turns out that they're, um, they're, the complex is assembled in the cytoplasm, and then they're imported into the nucleus um, as this small RNA argonaut complex. And so just the localization that I've shown you in the cytoplasm did not necessarily tell us that they're functioning there, uh, they could actually be uh, loaded in the cytoplasm and then moved into the nu nucleus uh, where they're functioning. And so this is an active area of investigation in the lab. Okay. Um, and so then the last thing I wanted to mention is that there, there's a really cool phenotype uh, for these plants. So I, I essentially showed you this phenotype above, which is at normal uh, maize development uh, temperature. So this is just a cycle of daytime and nighttime temperatures, and each data point is, is um, a time point in a day over many days of development. So you can see that's around 28 degrees in our greenhouses. Um, this is the heterozygous uh, sibling, which is male fertile. Uh, this is that male sterile that phenotype that I showed you at the same temperature of the homozygous mutant. Um, but if we lower the temperature, if we grow the plant um, in our, like our Arabidopsis greenhouse, for example, um, what we can do is recover full male fertility in that dicerified mutant. So this is the same uh, genotype uh, just grown at a lower temperature, and we get really nice, uh, happy pollen uh, from this as well. So something about this, uh, these phase RNAs are dispensable at these lower temperatures, um, and, uh, and so we're really curious to understand what that is. So we have lots of interesting questions. Um, maybe I, I won't go over them in detail because I want to hand it over to Sebastian so that he can tell you about his work. Uh, but just to hit on a couple of high points, uh, we know that there's an enrichment in the tapetum uh, and the absence of the phase RNAs impacts tapetal development and thus male fertility, and we can rescue this under low temperature conditions. So with that, I'm going to uh, exit out of this uh, presentation and switch it over to Sebastian's presentation. And hopefully that switch was successful. Can you see that? Not, not yet, Blake. Okay, let me, um, let me, ah, I need to share again, sorry. How does that look? Great. Perfect. Okay. Go back and turn on the laser Lovely. pointer and hand it over to Sebastian, who's sitting right next to me. Great. Thank you, Blake. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to get an, this opportunity to present my current research activities as the Barley Community in Initiative. Um, my work aimed to contribute on the development of a breeding system capable to unlock cross-pollination in barley and wheat for the deployment of hybrid vigor. As most of you know, um, these two species are part of the top five major crop. Barley is important to support the alcohol industry and feed animal livestock, while wheat is essential for food security. But maintaining or even increasing the productivity of this um, species will be challenging in coming years because the demand in this product will increase with the world population, while consequence of climate change may limit the productivity or compromise the cultivation of these species in some regions. As an example, on this map, you can observe in a gradient of yellow to dark red, the distribution of wheat growing area um, regions. Unfortunately, some of these regions overlap with those identify at risk of severe water scarcity during the wheat season. Part of the solution can be the deployment of the hybrid vigor that is known as a major factor contributing to boost the yield and the tolerance to stress. The hybrid derived yield increase is just impressive in some species. Um, just as an example, oil seed crop, common bean, rice, this is um, an increase up to 200% uh, of yield in oil seed crop. 
previous work have shown um, a lower uh, yield increase in barley and wheat hybrids. It's not negligible, it's 10 to 20%, but that's a range below the other species. Some authors suggest that it could be related to the use of a three-line hybrid system. So a solution uh, to explore is the development of a two-line hybrid system and its use and its deployment in the seed industry. A two-line hybrid system basically can be summarized by the presence of a female parent that can be pollinized by a male parent producing the hybrid seeds. The key in this system is this line in which we can use environmental signal to develop a switchable phenotype between male sterile and fertile development. Under restrictive condition, ideally the normal grow condition, we will have a male sterile development. And at um, different uh, grow condition, we can restore the fertility and maintain our genotype by self-pollination. As Blake has mentioned in his, uh, the first part of our seminar, is that small RNA pathways um, manipulating reproductive phase RNA can be used to regulate this phenotype. I will recall some aspect or um, rationale that Blake has shown before. We have two groups of reproductive phase RNA. The first group um, initiate and accumulate in premeiotic stage of enter. This is a 21 uh, nucleotide phase RNA, which initiate by the recognition of uh, RNA transcript by uh, MIR-21-18 uh, MIR organoprotein complex. The cleave transcript is converted in a double-stranded uh, RNA. via RDR protein before to be um, degrade our process in small RNA duplex of 21 nucleotide by the DCL4 protein and then recruit by an organoid protein to catalyze their function. The second group, um, it, it, the, the biogenesis uh, involved the same step, but there is some component that are uh, unique to this pathway, namely MIR-2275, DCL5, and presumably an organoid protein loading the phase RNA. It has been shown in rice that spontaneous mutation arising in a precursor of the 21 phase RNA yield a photoperiod sensitive um, genic maze sterility. And as Blake mentioned in maize, a uh, description of TCL5 protein gene um, allowed the development of a maze sterile phenotype the normal growth condition, and then the rescue of the male fertility on a lower temperature. My role in the Blake's lab, why I move in this lab to make my postdoc, is to explore the possibility to use um, DCL5 as a candidate gene to um, yield um, uh, environmental genic male sterile uh, phenotype in barley, drum wheat, and bread wheat. In collaboration with our um, collaborator at the John Ines Center, we developed mutant um, following two strategies, the use of existing tailing mutant populations and the development of our uh, own um, mutant using genome editing tools. Um, here I want to highlight a previous work that we did this year, um, making the phylogenetics of um, different um, for different gene coding protein involved in the biogenesis and function small RNA, where we identify that barley have one copy of DCL5, Zeromoid have two, and breadweed have three. For the development of the Zerum wheat, my colleague, Dr. Azara Martin, had identified um, two tilling lines having a stop cotton in the A and the B subgenome of the room wheat. She performed crosses genotyping and selection, yielding a single and double mutant of um, loss of function DCL5 in the room with. At the John Ines Center, again, my, our colleague, Dr. Eta and Dr. Smithley had performed genome editing of exaploid wheat, producing single, double, and triple loss of function mutant. And in our lab, with the collaboration of um, talented postdoc student and a mentee, we establish our um, barley transformation protocol and produce our um, barley mutant. For that presentation um, about the phenotype and its characterization, today we'll focus on the Zerum wheat that is the work that is the more advanced. 
The first question at that step is, um, does a loss of function of DCL5 can yield a male sterile phenotype under normal growth condition? And the answer at this question is yes. Here you can observe in this photo a spike of the room wheat, where we observe no seeds in um, this spike, um, suggesting this is male sterile. So <clears throat> we observe that a single allele of the A or the B copy in any combination as long as one copy is functional, it maintains the male fertility. And there is no impact of um, a loss of function of TCL5 on the male fertility. And no pleiotropic effect has been observed. To explore more um, the developmental defect of the ENTER, we perform um, uh, a time series um, enter, um, histological work on ENTER development. Unlike microscopy, at 13 stage of development, we perform um, a cross section. Here's the lobe that um, the enter that Blake showed in maize before. That's the one in the room width. And we have four tubes, so four lobes. And here the micrograph show uh, one lobe of the fertile and the sterile uh, Newton. We notice uh, no developmental defect up to the, the end of the meiosis. And we observe at early stage of post meiotic. Um, appear some developmental defect, mainly related to the developing palindrome. Um, among the things that I want to highlight here, this is um, the distance between the tapetum and the developing palindrome in the sterile mutant. The contact is less intimate between these two um, cells. Um, then also we have um, a cell shape and spatial distribution of developing palingrain that is abnormal in the sterile mutant compared to the fertile wild type. To get more insight about uh, the developmental defect that occur in our entire, we perform an electron microscope uh, histological work on it, electron microscopy. Here I will first to show just the normal uh, phenotype of an entire on the fertile wild type. Here, this is a micrograph at 11,000 X magnification. And for people that are less um, familiar with an enter, um, I just here labeling the characteristic for cell layer, namely epidermis, endothesium, middle layer, and tapetum, as well as developing pine grain in the middle. And if we zoom here in the yellow dash box, um, among a couple of things that I want to highlight to contra contrast with my next slide where I show the mutant. We have an abundance of um, chloroplasts in the endothesium. And um, <clears throat> developing pollen grain have a regular shape, thick cell wall, and intimate contact with the ubiquitous body that are abundant and make the interface between the tapetum and the developing pollen grain. And the tapetum itself is very dark, so it's very dense in the cytoplasm, uh, indicating a high uh, metabolic activity. It's very contrasting um, what we observe in the sterile mutant, and it's a little bit different to what had been observed previously in maize. Uh, in maize, the defects were uh, observed mainly in the tapetum, and then when the tapetum defect appear in the tapetum in maize, it has repercussion on the developing pollen grain. Us, what we observe is that most of um, cell type show um, a defect or another. And among these, we observe, for example, very large vacuole in the tapetum and the endothesium. And in the endothesium, the nucleus and the chloroplasts are, um, um, are trapped beside the, 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 the cell wall by the vacuole or compress. And also, <clears throat> we observe uh, less abundant and ir with irregular shape ubiquitous body. Um, then the question was, um, we are happy, we can control and induce maize sterility, but to develop a um, functional um, two-line two hybrid system, we need to be able to restore the maize fertility. So we observed that we can do it. Here what I show is um, a fertile spike showing a plenty of seeds in the spike. And this is um, plants that have grow at the same temperature and photo period in greenhouse, but when an emphasis arise in winter rather than in fall, since we didn't alter the temperature or the photo period condition, we hypothesize that it could be related to the male, um, the, male the light quality or intensity over this period. 
to explore on that hypothesis, we look at the condition recording greenhouse over the period of male sterile and male fertile condition. Here on this graph, I show the natural light in the upper graph and the total light in the bottom graph that I've been provided to plants for um, every single day over a period of 60 days. And the data points record um, over the 60 days um, the light capture um, at every hour. And what we observe is that when the male restores fertility, we have a lower light uh, intensity that has been provided to plants. To test that hypothesis, we repeat that ex this experiment in growth chamber um, without altering the temperature and the photoperiod, but just lowering the light intensity and observe the recovery in fertility, as you can observe here, since we observe uh, plenty of seeds in this pipe. So, to get more insight about um, what happened in the entire recovering the fertility, we compare um, the entire of the double mutant that recovered the fertility compared to the wild type. And on this EM micrograph, we observe some regions that show a phenotype similar to the sterile enter, and other regions here where we observe a phenotype quite similar to the wild type, indicating that there is a partial recovering in the first CT, but good enough to produce a couple of pollen grain that allow the, um, the self-pollination. This observation we did on the Zurum wheat are different um, of those that have been uh, discussed before, before by Blake and Maïs about um, the temperature that can allow the restoration of the fertility, but also the developmental defect that we observe in enter. So <clears throat> we perform small RNA analysis to compare um, small RNA, physio RNA in wheat and maize. A prior work that we did had compared um, at seven stage of development, three stage of premiotic, three stage of meiotic, and one stage of postmeiotic. Physio RNA accumulating in two variety of barley and one variety of wheat. And what we observe is the abundance of fast flow size is extremely abundant in these three TC species, more than 11,000 loci. Then we observe that the distribution of physio RNA are temporarily different in barley and wheat compared to maize. Here on this heat map, I show um, every line um, show the relative abundance of physio RNA over the development of enter that here are in column, premiotic stage, mid meiotic stage, and post meiotic stage. And here what we observe is this group of physio RNA at the peak of abundance at meiotic stage of enter. To our surprise, we observe that on premiotic stage, another group of physio RNA loci expressing physio RNA at the very early premiotic stage, which this group is absent in maize and rice. So to get more um, information or better understand what happened between um, the evolution of maize and rice to barley and wheat, we performed the same experiment but over uh, seven species, including one bamboo and six poidi. What we observe is the presence of premiatic 24 physiognomy in every of these species, suggesting that the emergence of premiatic 22 24 physiognomy might arise before the divergence on bimbusoidi and poidi species. That being said, then the question was, um, okay, we have two groups of physiognomy. Does DCL5 control the regulation or the biogenesis of these two groups? So we sampled um, enter at premiatic, meiotic, and postmeiotic stage on the wild type durum wheat and the DCL5 mutant expressing a single area of A or B genome, and observe no difference in the pattern of accumulation of 24 physio RNA and fertile enter. But on the sterile enter, on the homozygote mutant, there is a complete depletion of 24 physio RNA, indicating that DCL5 control both categories of 24 physio RNA. To make a Conclusion of the presentation, um, now we can say that a loss of function of DCL5 induced male sterility. Then we can also say that the fertility of DCL5 mutant can be restored under specific growth condition in the room with. Then physio RNA loss are extremely abundant in 3TC species. Absent in mice and rice, premiatic 24 physio RNA emerged before the divergence on bambuzoidi and poidi. 
Analogs of function of DCN5 interrupt the production of both premiotic and miniotic 24 physiognomy. I will finish by um, make some acknowledgement of people uh, involved in this work. Unfortunately, it didn't um, include the, for the presentation that Blake mentioned before, but for this respect, this particular project, um, thank you to Blake to uh, hired me to work on this project on his lab. Then the collaborator that had been involved um, at the John Innes Center, Dr. Martin, Dr. Moore, Dr. Martin, Dr. Eta, and Dr. Smithley. And finally, different um, collaborator at the Denport Center that have contributed in an aspect or another of my work. And finally, this work has been um, possible by the American and UK funding agency. And I want to thank the uh, government of Quebec and Canada for the postdoctoral fellowship. Um, thank you, and we will be happy to take your, your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, so I think there are some, there are definitely questions in the chat. Please feel free to keep adding your questions to the chat. Um, so I'll start with one from Luke Ramsey who asks, um, and I guess both of you could address this, um, whether mutations in uh, DCL5 have any effect on female gamete, uh, gamete development. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I think we have not studied that in detail, but I can say that in, in maize, for example, um, where, uh, where if, we, if we pollinate uh, the Dicer 5 mutant with wild type pollen, we get robust seed set. So uh, from at the phenotypic level of seed set, we don't see an impact. But that's okay. not to say that that there may not be some subtle defects that we haven't sure. observed. Yeah. yeah, or another kind of additional phenotype that might be kind of lurking in there. Yeah. Um, so I also have a couple questions from Ryan, um, uh, more on the breeding side. So Ryan asks um, if the temperature at which fertility switching occurs is practical for the broad deployment of hybrid seed production for spring and winter types in wheat and or barley, and then I guess a related question about breeding using a double mutation to induce male sterility in, in wheat. Is this cost effective from a seed production standpoint? So some kind of translational questions for you both. Sorry, I just didn't catch the early part of the question. I tried to- Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, so Ryan wants to know if the fertility switching that you see is practical for broad deployment of hybrid seed production based on the temperature at which you're seeing it. So is that is that something that would be practically applied for either uh, spring or wheat, uh, wheat uh, uh, varieties um, and wind varieties of wheat or barley? Yes, um, that's a good question, actually. Um, this is still in progress and we are repeating that uh, experiment. This is preliminary results. So we will confirm and have a, a better um, threshold between um, fertile, sterile to have a clear cutoff between both. I think on a practical point of view, what is important is when it has to be sterile, it's need to be mm -hmm. fully sterile. Mm -hmm. And recovering the fertility, this can be done at lower scale in sure. a control environment. Mm -hmm. So if we control and we are repeating the experiment and get more metrics about this, but as long as the control of the male sterile condition are strong, um, then I think it can be practical. But of course, here in St. Louis, um, it's not a region for this. So I'm looking to get a more appropriate um, regions to make the field essay and get <laughs> this in real condition. Yeah. I, I might also add that photo period would, would be a, a uh, much more mm -hmm. desirable mm -hmm. uh, regulatory mechanism than temperature because sure. um, obviously temperature can't be controlled. <laughs> <Whereas photo period. laughs> Predicted very well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but in, in China, um, two line hybrid production in rice, uh, they use several loci for, for maybe 20% of uh, hybrid rice production uh, that are environmentally controlled and predominantly photoperiod sensitive. And those turn out to be loci that produce the phase RNAs, not the 24s that we told you about, but the 20. Mm -hmm ones that I mentioned briefly in my, my introduction. So there is a precedent for photoperiod 
uh, sensitivity by perturbing reproductive phase RNAs. I'm just not sure that we're there yet in the case of wheat and barley. Fascinating, fascinating. Thank you. Um, so Ryan had a related question about using a double mutation to induce male sterility in wheat. Is this cost effective from a seed production standpoint? Um, maybe we're not <laughs> qualified to answer the question. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> As a small RNA biologist, uh, uh, I, I don't know. We'd have to, to uh, work with some breeders and agricultural sure. economists to better judge that. Okay. Um, so I also have a question from Wilma, uh, who um, who is also interested in in how the phase e RNAs are acting on male fertility in a temperature sensitive way, and she wants to know if there's anything known about the molecular mechanism or network through which um, this is this effect is happening. Yeah, that's a that's a great question and mm -hmm. one that we would love to answer. Um, and we we don't know. We have we have lots of ideas. Um, 20, uh, well, small RNAs in all other cases, uh, function by interacting with other RNAs and that interaction is mediated by Argonaut proteins. Um, and the, the size of the small RNA in other pathways dictates what those small RNAs do because they get loaded into Argonaut. So typically 21 MERS function in, by directing cleavage, 24 MERS function in the nucleus to direct DNA methylation. Um, in this case, uh, these are such a unique class of 24-mers that there may well be a unique argonaut that does right. something different, which is not DNA methylation. And in fact, we've done some DNA methylation analysis and we don't have substantial evidence for that. Um, so the, the short answer is we don't know. The longer answer is that we're working on that uh, in part through investigations of the argonaut proteins. Right. That's probably the effectors of, of uh, whatever it is that they're doing. Fascinating. Great, thank you. Um, we have a, a, a question here from Rinchuan. Uh, who is uh, saying that he's analyzed small RNA sequencing for barley, potato, and tomato in the past few years and found the quantification of small RNAs vi variable between bioreps, limiting the ability to detect differentially expressed small RNAs. Is this something you've observed in your projects? And uh, do you have methods to suggest improve that you can improve the sensitivity of this differential expression analysis? Mm -hmm. I have to send my point of view. I didn't add experience this difficulty um, <clears throat> maybe it's because of the source of my rna that enter quite well synchronized so as long as you do um, very careful sampling of your enter homogeneous set of enter and that uh, you have a good rna extraction protocol and you have no degradation it's not a problem that i have experienced but i heard this with some people working on more complex um, system and the advantage of NTOR when I work on microspore before is that um, this is very contrasting from 0.2 millimeter to 0.8 millimeter, yes, yeah. completely a different reality. Mm -hmm. So it's so contrasting that it's quite um, uh, easier to quantify. And I had a good homogeneity. So, um, but I will be happy if I can help to get an email and just see, um, to have a discussion with him if I can help. I will say um, recently an observation I did is the method of normalization that you use of your rep. Um, I have showed this in a lab meeting maybe a few months ago. I tried different type of um, quantification and often we go with different program that normalize with very stat fancy and sophisticated statistic. And what I observed for small RNA is actually just a normal count per million uh, to normalize your library, just outperform any other, like if it's different to mRNA for the quantification. Yeah. yeah I would also add that the detection method um, can, if you can give you relatively different results. So we've compared different library kits from different companies and there is a, a fair amount of variability. It's often dependent on the 
uh, ligation of the adapter to the molecule and that there's some ligation bias depending on the nucleotide that is at the three prime end of the adapter where it's ligated to the five prime end of the small RNA or the same thing at the other end. Uh, because the, the ligase, uh, the enzyme does not treat all nucleotides identically. And so depending on how the kit is constructed, if you compare one kit to another, you may get substantially different results. Um, that's why we try to always use the same kit, same process, everything to minimize that variation. Yeah. So you know, just a, a little bit follow on that. On that. Thank sure. you very much uh, for for your comments. It's really helpful. Um, we we did all those normalization steps as well. We had a, like a high resolution adapter that is like um, have variable kind of uh, can can uh, like uh, deal with variable kind of uh, sequence biases, but still like even we use the normalized. Uh, the read counts, we even don't see the separation of, of different treatments. So for example, if you do a PCA plot on your small RNA sequencing data, would you be able to see very clear separation of different time points and with the bi-rep bi, bi cluster together very well? Yeah, all my bi rep are very like each other and all time points are very, very contrasting. All right. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think we've experienced that issue that you described before. All right. Okay. I, I think if you are going to do small RNA sequencing in the future, we'll definitely ask for the, your protocols to. Certainly. I would be very happy to help. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's great. Um, uh, a question here has come in from Afshin Malik, um, who said, since such lines require strict environmental conditions, do you think it would prove robust and economical <laughs> for hybrid seed production in situations where the temperature is rapidly increasing? So I guess mm -hmm. it's kind of related to what you've touched on a bit. Yeah, <clears throat> of course, like I said before, uh, it's still a work in progress. So we try to have a more robust phenotyping to have um, kind of a, a fair protocol, how to cultivate this in appropriate condition. Um, I, I would say um, if temperature would be nice because it will always already be a very big breakthrough in wheat to be able or barley to be able to uh, outcross and produce hybrids. But like Blake mentioned before, we are working and um, making a new project to explore alternative way to reach the photoperiod uh, sensitive that will be the the early graal um, on the practical point of view i mean again we may want to look with uh, economists and these things but i remember my phd lab they work on soybean and to advance the generation faster they was in collaboration with um uh, a business and they make a generation of soybean in summer in North America, and they make another right. generation in the South Hemisphere in winter time. So they make two generations per year. So I guess now with uh, globalization uh, context and the large case of some organization, I'm quite sure there is an environment that somewhere uh, that will give uh, a more appropriate condition right. that can be, um, if it's really present an economical benefit, I think at that point, this should not be, on my point of view, a bottleneck. Okay, great. Um, I have a few questions, which I put in the chat, uh, so I'll maybe just ask a couple of them here, but please feel free to add, add a few uh, more questions in the chat if you'd like. I think we have, have enough time for that. Um, I was really interested, um, Blake, in your tissue layer specificity accumulation of, of these various components, and I'm curious about how you think that's being driven, and if it is kind of very specific dice or like five expression, and we know that, that this was this duplication, have you looked at the promoter to see in dice or five, for example, versus dice or three, if there are any motifs or anything that could, could explain that specificity? Good question. And um, in the case of the dicers, we have looked a little bit 
Um, we haven't done too much work on it to validate it. Uh, and maybe to, to spin your question in a slightly different direction, there's also a high degree of specificity in the expression of the precursors for the 21 and 24 yeah. nucleotide phase RNAs. Yeah. And in that case, we have uh, hundreds or even thousands of loci. So as Sebastian mentioned, um, in, uh, in the case of the 24mers in the uh, barley and wheat genomes, there are thousands of these loci that are yeah. coordinately regulated. So uh, the the transcription factors yeah. that are activating them in such a cell layer and uh, tissue specific manner um, are are really of strong interest. Because right. if we could knock out those transcription factors, maybe we could phenocopy the dicer five mutant. Absolutely. For yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so in in the case of maize, we've characterized. Uh, four different BHLH transcription factors that seem to be important for the process. We have a paper that just came out about that. Um, and, but there's those transcription factors are also active in other um, in other tissues. So it seems right. to be maybe a combi combinatorial um, factor, and we may be missing some transcription factors that make it specific for for certain layers. In terms of the, the promoters, though, uh, we have not yet identified what are the key motifs that cause that that are bound by those transcription factors that lead to this very specific regulation, and and that's not really for a want of trying. Um, okay. So we think that those binding sites must be more complicated than right. we've been able to. To discern. Really neat, neat, fascinating. I have one question for Sebastian. Um, I was really curious about these, what did you, Ubishk bodies? Um, and what do we know about them? And where do they come from? What are they made up of? What's going on there? And who's Ubish? <laughs> yeah, and he, is, is, is he the person, he or she, presumably a he, <laughs> looking under a microscope in the 20s or something? Could have been a she, yeah. Yeah, actually, it looked like quite long as I've been described, um, but I find very little about how it's work and what is clearly doing. Um, it's I've been reported maybe five, ten years ago in a PNS paper that uh, it secretes a specific molecule that is necessary to the polymerization of the the potent cell wall. But beside this, I didn't find really. I did a quick search, but I didn't find that oh. much of information or more information about this. Um, but at some point, we we think about the tapetum is recognized as um, to nourish the developing pollen grain, but how the molecules are transport. So is it like a kind of a mediator or something like this that can then translocate some molecule or facilitate the translocation of this molecule? Um, I don't know more about this, but they, they are pretty a uh, structure. Lots of yeah. interesting questions for the future, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Really, really fascinating. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, there's just one, I guess, one final question. Oh, and, and Ryan suggests that uh, Gibbish bodies um, are made up of sporopollenine. So that's something for us to, to think about as well. Fascinating. Um, Molecule. Um, so, Gujin Gang uh, wants to know if wheat's dicer like five mutant phenotype is stable, how many generations have you been observing this effect? And I think um, that'll probably be the, the final question for today. Um, for now, we have, I think we are at back cross four. So, we keep going oh, back crossing yeah. to arrive at back cross seven, eight to have a very pure um, mutant. And for now, we have. Um, no issue or no loss of um, its efficiency or anything like this. So it doesn't look to have effect yet. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, maybe I could provide yeah. a, a, an added answer to that, which is that in, in maize, mm -hmm. we're currently uh, working to integrate the mutant into different backgrounds so that we can see whether there are other modifiers because of course there's a lot of variability from uh, maize genotype to genotype and so uh, it may be that the the clean phenotype that we observe in the background in which we've done most of our work is not the same in, in other backgrounds so in terms of the um, the stability of the phenotype 
Uh, so far, we feel like we've been fortunate in that it's been uh, clear and stable, but uh, it actually might be interesting if we did not have that stability, because that might give us some additional low side to yeah. work with that are uh, somehow I interacting with um, with Dicer 5 or, or the password. Yeah. yeah, get a handle on it. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you all, um, everyone who's um, logged in today. Um, thank you for everyone who asked questions. Um, and uh, I know Donna has put in information in the chat about uh, the next seminar on the 8th of September, uh, My Story of Mar Maris Otter. Um, so please uh, keep, uh, keep a lookout for the invitation to that seminar. Um, and I would really like to thank um, both Blake and Sebastian again, uh, for starting your day with us, <laughs> so um, and please have have a great uh, rest of your day, and we hope that we can welcome you both in Dundee um, and to the IBH very soon. Excellent, thank you very okay. much. Really appreciate it. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Yeah, Gregor, are you there? Yep. I'm still here. Do you need me for anything? No, thank no. you. That was really good. Gregor, okay. Stop recording. Thank you.